Hi and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. If you've been watching this series of videos, you'll know that I've been doing a series of tests and experiments on these two media processors on this board. This is the innards of a Lenkeng LKV373A media extender, and it's used for capturing HDMI imagery and sending it across a network to a TV. And both these chips have very little public information out in the open about it. They're both made by ITE, who release very little information about this without NDAs. So I'm doing a bunch of reverse engineering to see how much I can find out about these two processors. And particularly this one, U2, uh, which captures the HDMI and encodes it in H.264. Uh, we've made quite a bit of progress in understanding how this is programmed. But there are still some major mysteries that I'd like to uncover, including what is the compression algorithm used in the flash chips that store the firmware? And there is also a checksum in that uh, firmware in those flash chips that I'd like to figure out what the algorithm for that is. So I'm going to continue doing a bunch of experiments to see what mysteries we can uncover about these chips. Now, one of the things that's been helping me along in this project has been this leaked data sheet. And the data sheet isn't publicly available from ITE, but I found by Googling this uh, data sheet for the ITE 9910 uh, up on GitHub on someone's repository. And looking through this file, it only gives us some vague high level information about the functionality of the chip, the overview of the features, a little vague dot block diagram showing what's inside it. It gives a pinout, which is useful for trying to identify the chips. You can check uh, that the wiring matches one very variant or another of this chip. Um, and then down in the middle here, there's a bit more detail about these uh, different functional blocks the chip has, but nothing, uh, nothing that equates to a technical manual. Uh, but you can try and figure out a few things by reading between the lines and comparing uh, the information in here with various other bits of information that have been gleaned along the way. Uh, but it doesn't give us enough to actually program this device. Now, one thing I found very interesting is this page here, which has the memory map. So it shows what the address space of the ITE9910 is actually populated with. Now, I often find that if I'm trying to find out secret information about various Chinese products and chips, it's well worth having a look on Baidu, which I believe is the largest search engine in China. And if you just search it with a keyword or some kind of identifier or something, uh, nine times out of 10, it will draw a blank. But every now and again, every once in a while, we hit the jackpot, as we do in this case, the third link that comes up uh, links through to this site. And there's a few copies of this scattered around. And what we get after it loads is this file here, which if you look at it, you can see this is a header file containing the register definitions, the addresses of the various registers for the ITE 9910. And I've checked this through and it does indeed correspond with the memory map. So although this isn't a technical reference manual for the register set inside this chip, this certainly gives us a lot more information to understand what is being programmed when various bytes are being read and written from the addresses that are defined in this header. So we now have a lot more detail on the structure of the IT9910's memory. And we also, of course, have the ability to write any custom software by patching the upgrader uh, that's built into the upgrade package. So it will be interesting to try dumping out the state of these various peripherals and see what they do, or maybe manipulate them and see what we can do with that. But before doing that, one thing that I think it would be really interesting to try is uh, this at the beginning here. So you can see we've got these two columns, memory map after booting and memory map before booting. And the only difference between them is the address to which this ROM is mapped in. So I think what this ROM refers to is a mask ROM that's built into the IT9910. And this is used to load up the software from the SPI flash into memory. And I'm assuming this is the tantalizing possibility that it contains the code necessary uh, to do the decompression and also verify the checksum. So we might be onto something here. So I think the next step is to try writing some software that can dump out this ROM through the U2 serial port. And if we can do that, maybe we'll find something really, really interesting. So this is the Python script that I'm using to dump out the ROM. And it centers around this function in the middle, write dump firmware. And it takes the original Lenkeng upgrade blob and the upgrader software that's built into it and modifies the upgrader to make it do what we want. And the way it works is pretty simple. It just has a loop which goes through and prints out using printf uh, and it prints the address and then 32 bits of data on every line. And then so what the chip will produce is a big long spew of data in hexadecimal coming out of the serial port. 
Now, one of the problems we have is that there's a watchdog built into the ITE 9910s, which means that we only have so long before the system will kick in and reboot itself. So whatever we do needs to be done within the period of time that's available to us. So I engineered this thing so that it can automatically reboot the system over and over and dump out a little bit more of the ROM every time. But as it turns out, it wasn't actually necessary, and this was a bit over-engineered uh, because the ROM is small enough so that it can actually be dumped out in ASCII in a single sitting. But it's pretty awesome that we have such control over the device that we can do these things to it programmatically with a simple Python script. Now loading up our dumped out ROM inside BinViz, we can have a bit of a view of the structure of what's in this ROM. And as you can see, it's all quite homogenous. There's not really any obvious signs of structure here. There are not really any strings to speak of, apart from right at the end, I found these two strings, kproc and sys. No idea what they refer to, uh, but the rest of it all just seems to be executable code, which is probably what we'd expect. Now just looking through the hex dump here, I've noticed something that is extremely promising because as we look through, you can see smedia02 embedded in the code. So these are instruction opcodes and these are bits of uh, binary data which are the arguments of those opcodes. So I think what we're seeing here is some code that checks the signature for smedia02. And similarly, if we keep searching down, uh, there's an instance of smas here. And there are a couple of instances of these strings buried in the code in different places. So I think what we're seeing here is some code inside the blob, which is checking the signature smedia02 is correctly present at the beginning of the flash image. So this is extremely promising to see code like this handling these signatures here, and certainly an indication that we should dig deeper. Now, I'm reasonably optimistic about being able to make sense out of this thing because the total length of the ROM is only about 18 kilobytes. So I feel like we have a sporting chance of being able to make sense out of it. So here I have the file loaded up in obshdump, and this is definitely code for the RISC processor just as we would expect, but trying to get any more detail about what's going on here is quite difficult. We have a bit of a haystack to pick through here. Now to help me get a better understanding of what's actually going on here, I've written a few Python scripts to help me make sense out of the output of obshdump, including this one. This is annotate registers, and this takes the output of obshdump and looks for any address values which relate to the addresses that were given in the header file we found on Baidu, and then prints them into the text in a useful way. So if we look at the output here, instead of getting some incomprehensible absolute address, instead we get some annotations that make this a little bit easier to read and understand. And as we go through, you can see references to GPIOs and uh, various system-ish registers, I think, the sort of thing we might expect this ROM to be manipulating. So that's going to make things a little bit easier to understand. Now the other tool I've got is this tool here called Call Graph that takes the output from annotate registers and generates, as the name suggests, a call graph. Now in this architecture it's really nice and easy to see where function calls are happening and where they're returning back to. So it makes it quite easy to figure out what functions are actually in this ROM. Uh, which is nice, and I'm getting some good outputs here. So if I run this, uh, we get this graphviz dot file, uh, which we can load up in graphviz, and I'll do that in a minute. One comment I'd say about this is that I really, really like using graphviz. It's a really quick way to rustle up a nice diagram of what you've got. Uh, it's quite easy to make a script output the graphviz dot format. And if we load that up in x dot, here you can see we have a structural diagram of what's in the firmware. Now, if we have a look back at the leaked data sheet, you can see this page where it describes some straps that you can set high or low to configure the operation of the IT9910. And it's got a few different things here, but these two pins are dedicated to the boot mode and it describes four options. One of them's reserved. It can boot from an SD card or from NOR flash, which I assume is our SPI flash, or it can boot by cooperative mode, whatever that is. So with all that in mind, let's have a look at our dot diagram. So here we have the call graph and each of these boxes represents one function that has been picked out by the script and the arrows represent calls through to other functions inside the ROM. Now, as we zoom in, you can see what we've got in the labeling. So we start off with the address that the function resides inside the ROM, the number of instructions that it has, and various other bits of labels that I've tried to pick out. These are all the hardware registers accessed by each of these functions. And I've also set the script up to label if the function references SMAS or SMedia. 
So in this code, there are two references to SMAS and SMedia, these two functions here and this function here. Now looking at the thing as a whole, uh, one thing that's immediately noticeable is that all these functions here on the right and along the bottom make reference to the SD card controller, uh, which is a hardware unit inside the IT9910. And of course the IT9910 has the ability to boot off SD cards and SD cards are a little bit tricky to communicate with. So it's no surprise to see a fair amount of code involved with dealing with the intricacies of communicating with them. So in our case, because we don't care about SD cards at all, we can completely ignore all of the functions around here, which is a really nice state of affairs because it means we can eliminate great swathes of code from having to be considered. So now let's have a closer look at this group of functions over here. So we have this huge 1000 instruction function here, which has tons of functionality in it, and it makes reference to these three functions here, these little helper functions that have a couple of dozen instructions in each one. And one thing that all four functions have in common is that they all make reference to the SSP, which is the synchronous serial port, which is another name for the SPI port, which is a feature of the IT9910. So it's looking extremely promising that this set of functions will be the code that loads code in from the flash memory and unpackages it and prepares it for execution. So I've been trying to figure out the function of these three helper functions, and these two are still eluding me, but this one in the middle, 318, is used an awful lot, and its purpose seems to be to load a single word out of flash memory at a given address, and then it takes that word and puts it in a register R11. Now, as I've been going along in this project, I've slowly been accumulating more and more information about what goes into the S media format found in the flash chips. And to help make sense out of the things I know so far, I've been working on this script called S media dump, which is a work in progress. And as I discover more and more things, I can use it to extract more and more meaningful content from the flash chip. So if I run it, you can see what information it gives us. So we've got our S media uh, chunk here which has some fields containing the header length which is a chunk of data that comes before the SMAS and then the length of the SMAS itself. Right before the SMAS there's a couple of fields that come right before this uh, tag here, uh, the checksum as we discovered earlier and the total unpacked length of the SMAS data and then the SMAS data itself is divided into various chunks which have a little uh, mini header of their own uh, containing the unpacked length and the packed length and then there are a few zeros padded on the end and that's it and then this script will also output the files uh, for the SMAS uh, assembled together from the chunks and the header which appears between uh, the overall beginning of the file and the beginning of the SMAS section. Okay, so a lot of time has passed, several months in fact, and I've been quite busy with several other things, but in the background I've been steadily chipping away at this bootloader ROM, and I've made some quite good progress in understanding what's going on here, which I will explain. So the first thing I did was copy out the disassembly of the function into a text file, and if we look down the file you can see there's about 1200 lines of code here. And so to try and make sense out of it, I started adding comments, trying to annotate anything I could find, anything that appeared to make sense. And I began to put labels in the locations where any jump uh, instruction jumped into. And by doing this, you can slowly reveal the structure of this thing, trying to make sense out of the execution flow. And it helps a lot uh, that my script is able to label up all the hardware registers that this code is accessing. So that really makes things a bit clearer, gives you a little hint to see what's going on. But beyond a certain point, it becomes harder and harder to really know whether this code is doing whatever we think it might be doing. It's quite easy to get lost in this. So the ideal would be to be able to step through this code and see how it works in real life. Fortunately, there is a way that we can do this, and the way to do it is to patch the ROM image into the Flasher software. Now, the reason that this is possible is that in this architecture, most of the time, jump addresses are specified using relative addresses. So, for example, you can see here uh, this jump instruction has a FF leader here, which indicates this is a small negative number offset uh, that this jump address goes to which means that this is position independent code and you can move it to any memory address and it will continue to work. Now as it turns out this isn't completely true when it comes to switched case statements these are implemented using jump tables and these do contain app 
absolute addresses and these have to be patched to cope with the new location. But apart from that, if we want to move this uh, code around and patch it into a new location for it to run in, uh, in general it works out just fine. So the general method is that we take the normal flash upgrade software and that includes the S media payload at the bottom and the flasher software in the middle here. And within that we have an implementation of printf and then there's some code up here that uses printf to print SDK version. And this is the first message that gets printed out when this program kicks in when you do the upgrade. So next we take the ROM and paste it into an area of unused memory in the image. Uh, this area is filled with zeros. And so we can take our ROM and paste it in here. And within that we have the function, the SPI flash loader function that we want to delve into. So now we patch the SDK version printing code so that instead of printing SDK version, we instead jump into the beginning of our flash loader function. Now, if we run this, the ROM function is now running and we can see what it's doing because I have a logic analyzer attached to the flash memory with SIGROC SBI decoding and we can insert deliberate crashes by patching this to crash or insert infinite loops to make it halt at various points or delay loops to space things out a bit. And this allows us to try and uh, put some indicators into different parts of this function to try and figure out what's going on and what messages to the SPI flash this corresponds to. Furthermore, it's also helpful to be able to print things with printf, which it's possible to do. We just need two things. We need a place to store our printf strings here in this patched in data section, and we need a place to store some patched in code. Now how this works is that we can now patch a single instruction within our flash loader function so that instead of doing its normal operation, it will jump over to our patched in code. Now the first thing the patched in code does is save the states of all the registers to put them uh, on the stack so we can restore them later. And then it loads up the arguments to printf including the uh, message string and we'll jump over to the printf that's in the main software over here let that execute and print out the message and then it will return back into our patched in data section we then reload all the registers that might have got clobbered by printf running uh, set them back to the state as they were uh, when they were running along normally inside the function and then we run the instruction that we overrode in here so that then we can jump back into the flash loader uh, function here and it looks as if everything worked the way it was meant to. So this was a bit tricky to get right and was always a bit janky and unreliable but little by little I was able to figure out what the function is actually doing. Now trying to do all this patching by hand would be completely impractical so I've been using Python scripts to synthesize images which makes it a bit easier to do all these experiments. So now let's have another look at this breakdown of the structure of the S Media firmware. So we start off with the 8 by S Media 02 tag, followed by a 4 byte address here. Now this is the address of the offset at the beginning of this purple section. And then we have this gold uh, thing here. This is the address at the beginning of the SMAS data. And this blue field is the length of the SMAS data. So I discovered that the first thing the ROM function does when it starts up is that it reads through the fields of this header one by one and stores them away. And then it encounters this blue section here which contains some junk data and some copyright text and it ignores it completely and jumps straight over it to get to this magenta section. Now it took me a while to figure out what this section contains but the ROM function has a series of loops and switch case tables that it uses to iterate its way through this thing and after a while I discovered that this is some kind of microcode script that the ROM uses to initialize the MMP. Now the MMP is barely mentioned in the data sheet, there's not much mention of it at all apart from its location in memory, but I have a hunch that it is the multimedia processor or multimedia pipeline or something like that, and I would assume that it does the heavy lifting for all the video processing. So the ROM iterates through all this microcode until it encounters an exit instruction uh, which indicates the microcode has finished executing, and now it's time to process the SMAS section. 
So the first thing the ROM function does is that it loads up the checksum value from SPI flash and saves it for later. It then reads the SMAS header uh, the, and the signature, checks the signatures correct, and then it iterates through loading up the chunks of SMAS uh, data one by one and having them all decompressed into RAM. And then once it's done all that, it then computes the checksum of the data it just loaded, and then it compares it to the expected value uh, which it calculates. Now, interestingly, it appears that if the checksum is made out of all ones, as in it's minus one in value, I think that it will skip the checksum check entirely. So I haven't tested this yet, but it seems like it might be a handy way to bypass the checksum completely. Anyway, so now I bet you're really wondering what the mystery is of the checksumming algorithm and what the mystery is of the compression algorithm. And we should be able to read it right out of the assembly code, shouldn't we? But that would be far too simple. And it turns out that what this code does is it just loads addresses into the registers of a hardware unit called the DPU. And there's a few other usages of the DPU in here. And it uses this to decompress the firmware. And it also uses it to checksum the firmware. And there's basically no mention of it at all in the datasheet beyond its address range in the memory map. So I think you'll agree that we have fallen well down the rabbit hole now. We have this black box unit within the processor. How on earth are we going to figure out how it works? But of course, we do have the ability to write pretty much any custom software we like. So one obvious thing to try is just to try inserting some data into it and see what it decodes. So I've been making use of my rig to fuzz the DPU. And that means I use a script to generate large numbers of test cases with slight differences between them. And for each test case, it loads a hacked version of the upgrader that triggers the DPU with test data and prints out the results. And the script then collects the results in a log file for analysis later on. And then it triggers the reset button and then it does the process all over again, over and over and over, running test after test after test after test. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out how to make the DPU run more than once after a reboot. So every test case I run involves rebooting the system. So running a single DPU test run takes about 20 seconds. So far, I've tested over 14,000 test cases with the DPU and I've collected all the log files in a corpus, a big database collection of the results uh, stored in message pack format. Message pack is a bit like JSON, but for binary data. It's really handy. Check it out if you haven't seen it already. Anyway, of those 14,000 test cases, around 1,400 of them decoded successfully without the DPU aborting halfway through. So I've started trying to model the behavior of the decompressor with a Python script to try and make a simple decompressor. And I've been able to make the script correctly decode about 800 of those 1,400 test cases. So how does the SMAS compression work? Well, from what I've discovered so far, it's byte orientated. It never uses unaligned bit strings. And the SMAS data is made up of a series of chunks, which are between two and 10 bytes in length. And the first byte is a command byte. You could call it an opcode, which defines what the contents of the chunk is going to be. So for example, we've seen chunks that have a command byte of FF, these contain eight literal bytes in a row. In addition to literal bytes, a chunk can contain various types of back reference where it reuses data previously contained in the buffer and a bunch of other weird things that I don't completely understand. I tried to model them and more and more weird things keep emerging. Different types of extended back ref that seem to be present and different types of repetition and all kinds of uh, odd things seem to happen depending on what the opcode is with not much pattern that I've been able to discern so far. And the problem I'm having is that although I've modeled this with my Python scripts and I can decode 800 of these test cases, I clearly haven't got a correct understanding of how the decoder actually needs to work because my script doesn't have any predictive quality. As I keep adding test cases to the corpus, it just shows more and more ways that the script is not working. So I decided this project's gone on long enough before I've published any videos. So it was time to start trying to share this with the audience. And it's very, very interesting getting your reactions and feedback from the work I've done in the previous parts. 
And one question I had over and over was the question of whether this SMAS compression corresponds to this algorithm in this GitHub repository here for the small strings compression library. And the answer is no, I don't think it is that at all. I think it's just a coincidence that this algorithm shares the same name. But something else has happened that seems very promising indeed. This guy who goes by a Bridgewater, Alistair Bridgewater, reached out to me in my GitHub repository for this project and started noting down a load of observations he'd seen about the SMAS compression scheme. And he's made some really, really good progress. He's got some really great insights for things I'd missed in how this works. And I handed over every piece of information I had and there's a bit of a collaboration going on. This guy, uh, Alice Bridgewater is doing some great, great stuff and uh, Camille Trzinski, Velociraptors chipping in as well. So there's uh, a really good little project going on here to try and figure out what this SMAS uh, compression scheme really is. And by the looks of things, it may well get figured out pretty soon. So by the looks of things, we are on the verge of finding out the answer to all kinds of interesting mysteries about this processor. And if you're curious about it, perhaps you want to chip in and try some things yourself. So anyway, I'm Joel Holdsworth. If you enjoyed the content, give it a like and subscribe. And I want to thank everyone who's supporting my channel with donations. It really helps me improve the quality of my content, helps me uh, get gear and helps me do what I'm doing. If you want to donate, I've moved my donations over to Subscribestar and to PayPal, and you'll find links to that down below, along with the show notes, where there are lots of links and all the background information for this video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.